Well, if I can invite you back to your chairs and to get your Bibles, and if you don't have Bibles, we have some over there to your right. You're welcome to take one and make it your own. We're going to be walking through the first chapter of the book of Ruth this morning. We're starting a series in the book of Ruth, a series I've been looking forward to for some time. Um, it's a profound, delightful, true story. Looking forward to its benefit to our church. And if you were here last week, you know we, we did a, a study in the book of Judges. We do these overview studies at least once a year. We look at a whole book of the Bible, a large section. And it's actually valuable to have studied Judges last week because the book of Ruth happens during the time of the Judges. So uh, just if you were here last week, you would remember this. But just if you weren't, to, to create a little bit of the context for this story... Uh, Judges reveals the depth of human sinfulness. If you've ever read the book of Judges, or as we looked at it last week, you know that to be true, that there's a depth of chaotic sinfulness taking place in the book of Judges, in the time of the Judges, which is when Israel, God's people, have made their way to the land, and these various deliverers are, are rising up to help the people because they are consistently rebelling against God and being given over into the power of foreign leaders. Well, in this time of the judges, this, this obvious need arises for a deliverer. When will there be a deliverer who will save people from this chaos of sin, who will rescue Israel from her enemies, who will vanquish their foes? How, how, how will this person come? Will this person come? Well, the book of Ruth has a profound answer to that question. What will happen to the people of God who have degenerated into incredible sin? How will God treat them? How will God finally save them? Will God even care about them given how degenerate they have become? That's the question that the book of Judges raises. And so when you read in the first verse of the book of Ruth, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land all of that truth about the people's rebellion and their struggle to follow false gods and God's discipline of them in things like famine and their need for his deliverance and their compromises, it comes into mind. And one wonders, what is happening in the time when the judges ruled? What is God doing with his rebellious people? Ruth answers that question. Let's begin reading. We're going to take Ruth in four chapters. There's four chapters, and they break up quite nicely into four messages. So we're going to read chapter one all the way through, and then we'll study it together this morning. Ruth, chapter one, verse one. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah and the name of the other Ruth. They lived there about 10 years. And both Malon and Kilion died so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. 
And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way. For I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. This story can be divided into three scenes, three captions as the story moves through to the conclusion when the barley harvest is beginning and Ruth and Naomi have made their way. The first scene I would caption as ultimate loss, ultimate loss, verses one through five, and then we'll move beyond that to, to consider relentless love, verses six all the way down to verse 18, and then finally, blind despair, verses 19 through 22. So ultimate loss, first of all. There's a, a number of truths packed into this opening uh, paragraph of the book of Ruth. I, in some ways, uh, truths that if we're just reading it as a, a brief report or as a, 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 a disinterested reference of a family on the move, we, we might not appreciate it. It's, it's important to recognize this is the time again when the judges are ruling and for the nation of Israel, unlike today, this is not true in the New Covenant, but in the nation of Israel, uh, prosperity financially and agriculturally was tied to uh, the relationship of the covenant. God had made it very clear to them, when you come into this promised land, it will flow with milk and honey. However, if you rebel against me, that prosperity will begin to be removed from you as a punishment, as a discipline. And so the connection of those two things, the judges are ruling, should bring to our minds, okay, that's the time when the people are continually rebelling against God, they're turning towards idols, they're running from him, and then we hear there's a famine in the land. We're probably not supposed to hear that as just some random downturn in the crop cycle. That's supposed to be understood. Okay, wait a second. That's probably because of the rebellion that's taking place. Actually, throughout the book of Ruth, we're, we're often called on to see seemingly natural, seemingly coincidental occurrences as having an underlying cause. At the end of the book of Ruth, you, you end up saying, how could that many coincidences have taken place? 
The answer theologically is they couldn't because they're not coincidences. So we're supposed to see, first of all, this is part of this time when God's people are not in a good relationship with him. They, they've been resisting him. They're turning to idols. Now there's famine in the land. And the famine being in Bethlehem is ironic because Bethlehem means house of bread. So there's irony right off the bat in this paragraph. The house of bread is empty. God's people, supposed to have milk and honey flowing out of the land, are having a famine instead. One man named Elimelech, whose name means God is king, along with his wife Naomi, which means pleasant, chooses to leave the land of plenty, now experiencing famine, and to go to Moab. Now, this is a surprising choice for an Israelite. The country of Moab were enemies of God's people. They had resisted them on their way through the desert. Actually, Moabite women had proven to be an incredible religious snare. You can read about that in the book of Numbers. Incredible religious snare to God's people. They were one of the people that were known as having this atrocious moral heritage. You can read about that in Genesis. The founding of the, the country of Moab has to do with this uh, atrocious moral act. This is not a, a friendly neighbor. This is not a nice place to go. This is a place from a religious standpoint of obvious compromise and religious danger. And so the fact that this man, my God is king, and his wife pleasant, leave God's promised land with no hint of repentance or calling out for the Lord to restore uh, the food there, and they go to Moab, it just speaks of at least a pragmatic view of life, a lack of taking seriously God's calling of them into the promised land. Th this isn't like one of us moving from, you know, Cincinnati to Miami. You know, where are you going to live? It's, it's fine. Th th there's theological truth packed into this move for them. Miami is not the promised land, contrary to the natives, what they might say. Uh, th th this was the promised land, and they're moving from here is a, a statement at least of the willingness to flirt with religious compromise. Well, ironically, their move away from trouble to survive leads ultimately to death. Elimelech, my God, is king who has moved out of the land of Israel, is living in the land of Moab, seeking presumably a better life for himself, dies in that land. Following that death, the questionable decisions continue. His two sons, Malon and Kilion, they marry Moabite wives. I mean, if you're a faithful Israelite right now and you're reading this, you're thinking, Moabite wives? I mean, they were the ones that, that we were warned against. They snared us, turned us toward idols, and there was this incredible danger. Why would you go? What are you thinking? This isn't some, there's not a rebuke here against interracial marriage. That is not what's going on here. That is not what's in view. The, the reason there was warning here was because the, the Moabite women of the past had been drawing people away from the followership of Yahweh. This is not two godly different ethnicities loving Jesus. And this is more like a person who chooses to pursue a non-Christian who hates God and says, yeah, but I really like her and I'd like to marry her. Anyway, that's the cultural background that's present when you're reading this. At least it would raise severe questions about, oh, wow, this family is not taking seriously their calling to follow God. They are more concerned about their pragmatic comfort and well-being and what makes sense to them than they are about preserving their heritage as people of God and people of Judah, no less. Wow, this is a family that is facing the ultimate loss. Of all the losses present, Elimelech dies, they initially lose their food, they lose their homeland, then they lose their two sons, of all the losses present here, underlying them all and screaming to an Israelite reader would be, are they losing their faith? That's the ultimate loss presented here. This pragmatism, which actually hasn't worked out good for them at all, is coupled with the question of, is this, is this family abandoning Yahweh? Now, the, the narrator doesn't say, he just leaves it out. There is a possibility. Is this family abandoning 
their faith? They've lost now, when you reach the end of, of, of verse 5 there, you notice Naomi has lost everything. She went hoping to survive. Now she's lost her husband. My God is king, has died in a foreign land. Pleasant has lost both of her sons. And in that culture, perhaps the most devastating news was to find out your family line was now threatened with extinction, which is what she faces. Now in our culture, we tend to be individualistic. We don't worry about that as much. We wouldn't be concerned about that as much. Obviously, we'd be sad if husbands, spouses, children died, but, but the thought of the end of your line is profoundly grieving in this culture. The end of a line in Israel is now likely to take place. No children were born. The ultimate loss is underneath all of these other losses, and in this Old Covenant time, probably we're to see all of these other losses as connected with that first decision anyway. The people of God have abandoned God, and some of the consequences in this time physically are now being brought about. Very, very important to clarify again, I do not think in the New Covenant time that physical losses equate with disobedience. However, in this covenant, as a way of displaying the severity of sin, that was how God dealt with his people. And so when we're reading this from that perspective and trying to understand the, the meaning, I think we're supposed to hear a warning, a sort of a low minor note striking. Have they lost their faith? At least they have shown a great flippancy towards Yahweh. At least they've allowed pragmatism to rule their decision-making. At least they are more concerned with helping themselves than calling on God for help. And so now you have this woman, Naomi, who has literally no future. The ultimate loss. If we're going to appreciate the rest of the book, we've got to feel the depth of this loss, the depth of this danger. And as it will come out later on, Naomi is far from concerned, far from sobered or repentant about her choices and exceedingly angry and frustrated at God for the practical outcome that has taken place in her life. Naomi actually is a, a metaphor in many ways of the people of Israel in the time of the judges. She's a lot like them. What is going to happen to this people, filled with compromise, wandering away from the Lord, not calling out to him, turning to idols. What's going to happen to Naomi and the people that are just like her in the land? How does God respond? Ultimate loss, section one. Section two, relentless love. Relentless love. Naomi hears one of these coincidences that we're supposed to see beneath. She hears that the Lord has visited his people and given them food. She hears of this in the fields of Moab. If we're going to understand Ruth, we've got to be paying attention to apparent coincidences. She hears that the Lord has visited his people and given them food. So she sets out from Moab. No wonder. What does she have there but grief and painful memories? No wonder she leaves. No wonder she leaves. She leaves Moab. She apparently is on the road. She sets out in verse 7 from the place with her two daughters-in-law. So they're accompanying her. We're to picture them sort of walking along the road. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But then Naomi seems to stop. We can almost picture them, these three ladies. They're walking on the road. And she sort of stops and makes a decision. And she turns to them and, and issues a command in verse 8. Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Now, on the surface, Naomi's response to them seems kind of noble. It, it feels kind of self-sacrificing, doesn't it, on the surface? It seems as though she's saying, look, I've got no future. I don't want to take you with me. You have a good chance of marrying again. If you stay in the land of Moab, you should stay. And she even 
puts icing on that request by saying, I hope Yahweh will do good to you, as you've done to the dead, probably my sons, and to me. May Yahweh bless you in the land of Moab. But underneath that statement, again, reading this with religious filter, don't you hear the irony? Go back to the land of Moab, and I hope Yahweh will do good to you there. Actually, it's incredibly ironic because Naomi uses the word chesed. If you've ever heard that word before, it's a Hebrew word, chesed. It's used throughout the Old Testament. It's a very important word, very, very important word to understand the book of Ruth. Maybe the most important word, probably. The most important word to understand the book of Ruth, chesed. It means a lot of English words put together. Okay? I'm sure you've heard pastors say that before. It's just because it's true. There's no English word. So that you'll see Bible translators will say loving kindness, you know, the, the loving kindness of the Lord, steadfast love. Sometimes it's translated. Um, just to read one um, commentator, he says this about hesed. It, it is a covenant term wrapping up in itself all the positive attributes of God. Love, covenant, faithfulness, mercy, grace, kindness, loyalty. In short, it refers to acts of devotion and loving kindness that, listen to this, very important, that go beyond the requirements of duty. Very, very important final phrase, that go beyond the requirements of duty. The first time that that word is used in this book, probably the most important word in this book, Naomi uses it to describe how her, her hope is that these women will be treated, and she points out that they have treated her and her sons in that same way. So right off the bat, we see a theme that's going to be present in, in Ruth. The steadfast, loving kindness, mercy, mercy, go beyond the ordinary, normal love of God, is wished upon a person, and a person is seen as being able to reflect that same love towards someone else. Huge, maybe the primary themes of Ruth are present right there. God's incredible, beyond the imagination, covenant love, which can be reflected from one person to another in human interactions. The pillars of Ruth from the lips of a woman telling these women to go back to Moab. Apparently, there's a way of talking about that kind of love, and then there's a way of believing it and living it. Now, Orpah, the first daughter-in-law, basically submits to the practical, reasonable logic of Naomi. You notice down there, she, Naomi goes into this rhetorical list barrage of questions. Ladies, you can almost hear the sarcasm. Ladies, let's be realistic. I'm too old to have a husband. I cannot bear you any more sons for you to marry. And even if I did, even if I was pregnant today, would you wait 20 years to marry them? Would you really refrain from... This is just this barrage of practical... Pra the assumption is you want the same thing we wanted when we went to Moab. And you're thinking about it the same way. Based on that assumption, practical comfort, a nice home, a little place of rest, may God bless you as you seek your practically prosperous life. It's very similar, I think, to maybe the cultural phrase that we use around here, bless your heart. It's kind of a nice religious phrase. It's not really viewed in like biblical terms. God bless you. That seems to be what Naomi is saying. She sprinkles it with, you know, God bless you because you've been a blessing. But practically, I'm assuming you're really, really decision-making can be based on practical thinking. I mean, obviously, you want to get married again. I can't provide you sons. My line is done with. It's over. I have no hope for any future. Elimelech's line, my God is king, uh, has no future. So you should attach yourself to something else. Now, Orpah follows this logic. Important to appreciate, the writer doesn't condemn her in any particular way, but we also never hear about her again. So there's this sense with Orpah where she's just doing what's reasonable. She's not a bad lady. She's not evil. She's not conniving. She's just reasonable. That makes sense. It reminds me of me a lot of times. Well, that makes sense. That's reasonable. God wouldn't want me to have a hard life. So that makes sense. 
So she leaves. Ruth clings to her in verse 14. And Naomi apparently decides Ruth needs a little more urging. So she points out Orpah. And while pointing out the issue with Orpah, she reveals, Ruth reveals, Naomi rather, reveals the true state of her compromised faith. Verse 15. Your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. Underneath Naomi's wish that Yahweh would bless them was the assumption that when they go back, they will associate geographically with the God of Moab. A horrendous religious system. She assumes that. You see, Naomi, Naomi has this very practical, pragmatic way of thinking about life. I hope my God blesses you, my God, that I'm pretty sure has just turned against me for no apparent reason. But I hope he blesses you as you go back to follow the gods that you've always followed in your youth. She's sort of a religious pluralist at this point. Now we come to the surprising, the surprising response of Ruth surprising. Naomi talks chesed love. Ruth's about to show it. Naomi talks about what chesed love looks like and how you've shown that. Ruth's about to prove it. She's about to demonstrate it. She's about to reveal for the first time a human expression of what the covenantal love of God looks like. So she has this marvelous speech which many of us would know is probably the best known part of Ruth. Basically, she says, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will never leave you or forsake you. And just to be very clear, where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. You have to understand, she's abandoning her people. She's abandoning her loyalties. She's letting go of every comfort, every place of familiarity. She's leaving it all. She's saying, I am abandoning allegiance to Chemosh. I am now transferring allegiance to Yahweh. Your God will be my God. And just so we're clear, I'm not just doing that thinking you're an older lady. Maybe you'll die soon and I can head back. No, 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 no. I will be buried where you are buried. My future is entirely wrapped up with you. Robert Hubbard, a commentator, says this, Orpah represents one who does the ordinary, the expected. There is nothing wrong with her conduct except that it is not hesed. By contrast, Ruth represents one who does the extraordinary, the unexpected. She was not content. She was not content to rejoin her Moabite family, remarry, and live as her contemporaries would. Ruth's love towards Naomi is relentless. It is relentless love. It is self-sacrificial love. It is abandoning of all personal comfort love. It is eternal love. It's tying her to past death. That phrase, God do so to me, uh, either it just would have been understood to mean any number of disasters or possibly uh, it would have been accompanied by some kind of verbal gesture. We might think of like slashing the, God do so to me. If anything but death parts me from you. In other words, I'll die before I'll let you go. Incredible, incredible devotion. She's going into a place where probably she's going to be ostracized. In all likelihood, she's going to be belittled. She is a foreigner from a country that has intense opposition and antagonism in Israel because of their history. 
In all likelihood, she's facing a life of ostracism. She has no uh, certainty of any future marriage. She has this older woman that she's assuming she's going to have to be caring for in her elderly years. She has no hope of children at this point. Her future is basically laid at the altar of serving Naomi. And in that act, she is also declaring, I am entrusting myself to God. My life is now in Yahweh's hands. It is as though she's saying to him, at the same time she's saying to Naomi, into your hands I commit everything about me. Incredible declaration and evidence of chesed love. Relentless love in the face of ultimate loss. Now, it's important, I think, at this point to understand how Ruth operates for us as Christians. There's two pillars in the, in the book of Ruth, and we've, we've got to understand them. You can see them already in this passage. Two pillars. One is, how will God relate to his desperately needy, compromising people. That's represented in Naomi. H how will God relate to them? And we should see ourselves in Naomi. Like Naomi, our lives are fraught with compromise. We wander in places we shouldn't. We forget about the value of God's inheritance and move towards other lands. We assume that we can build our own life rather than trusting in him. We don't respond to his discipline the way we should. I, I mean, we're a lot like Naomi in a lot of ways, right? A practical person thinks about their life practically, not in terms of God's perspective, God's will, what God wants for me. They're like Naomi. They just make reasonable decisions. How will God treat Naomi? How will God relate to a person like that? Then you have Ruth, which reveals the other pillar. In the book of Ruth, God's love is hidden. It, it, it's not supernaturally obvious. The whole book presents the opportunity to see God as working through other means. It, it, it's really a book inviting you to see the relentless love of God in coincidences and in human expressions of love. That, that's, that's really how you understand the book of Ruth. You could end the book of Ruth and say, man, she got lucky. Wow, what a great daughter-in-law. I mean, how could she have known? What a pick for mail on. I mean, what a great guy he was. Set up his mother well. Good job, dude. I mean, you could end the book that way. Or you can end the book saying, impossible. Only a sovereign hand could bring this about. And not just a sovereign hand, a sovereign loving hand. I think that the book of Ruth, the writer of the book of Ruth, invites us to see in Ruth's language the voice of someone else. Don't, don't you hear that? I think in Ruth's language, we're supposed to hear something else. And, and there's been hints that someone else is moving already. How did it happen to be that Naomi heard that the Lord had visited his people and given them food? How did that happen to be? Some news had come to her in her place of helplessness, in her hopelessness, and she had pragmatically turned towards it only to discover that right in her own backyard there was a person that was going to declare the very language of covenant faithfulness that the people of Israel had come to expect from Yahweh to them, coming out of the mouth of her Moabite daughter-in-law. Death itself will not separate my love for you. I'll be with you to the end. God do so to me and more so if anything but death separates me from you. Now, if Naomi is paying attention, if she's watching, if she's listening with ears and eyes of faith, she's going to say, you sound just like God. That's what God said to us. That's what he said to Abraham. 
took those animals, divided them in pieces, walked through them, said, this will happen to you, Abraham. I will fulfill this promise. And the symbolism means even unto death. Naomi should have taken a step back, bowed down and worshiped God right there. He should have, I'm experiencing the love of God through a Moabite woman. That's what we're supposed to hear as we read this book. God's love, God's relentless love, God's unstoppable love, God's redeeming love, God's merciful love, his covenant love. We're going to see it not in a thundering voice from a mountain. We're going to see it in news of the Lord visiting his people with food, his rebellious people, his people that are following false gods. We're going to hear it in the voice of a Moabite woman who speaks the same kind of covenantal faithfulness and you can hear someone behind her saying that same thing to Naomi. Naomi, have you ever heard someone else say this kind of thing to people like you before? Yes, you have. God's love is the hero of the book of Ruth. It's expressed through human sacrificial devotion. We'll see it later on. It, it's not so much that Ruth represents the love of God exclusively, because later on, there's going to be another figure who's going to represent that as well. It's that sacrificial love, wherever it's found in the book of Ruth, reveals the ultimate author of sacrificial love, God himself. So as you're going through Ruth, anytime you see coincidences that work out for the good of someone who should be discarded, or you hear words of generous sacrificial devotion, love, you should be thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. God is doing this for his people. God is doing this for his family. God is devoting himself to their well-being. God is choosing not to leave them. God is choosing to visit her. God is choosing to do what cannot be done, humanly speaking. When you hear about Naomi saying, I have no future, I can have no sons, my future is concluded, and then you hear Ruth saying, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, we should hear the divine echo. Wait, Naomi, wait, I think you have a better friend than you know. I think you have more than you think. I think you have someone who's worked with human impossibilities before. Relentless love. Third section, blind despair. Blind despair. So the two of them went on, it says in verse 9, until they came to Bethlehem. The town is stirred. No wonder they've been gone over a decade at this point. They greet her. Can this be Naomi? But she rebukes them. Do not call me pleasant, she says. Call me bitter. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full and came back empty. Why call me pleasant? when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me. So she came back, it says, at the beginning of the barley harvest. Blind despair. We're supposed to, I think, see the contrast between Ruth's incredible speech and Naomi's enduring bitterness. You see that contrast? Did you read that chapter? You have this incredible speech. I mean, just on a human level, even if she's not appreciating the divine cause of this whole thing, uh, you would think that would affect Naomi at some level. Zero report of her saying, now, the one good blessing in my life is this amazing daughter-in-law. I mean, she just stands there for the whole time. She's listening to Naomi bewail how she has come back empty. Apparently, Ruth does nothing for her. Apparently, she provides nothing. I've come back empty. Oh, I assume she was with you. What's happening with Naomi? Now, she's not wrong. It is 
true that ultimately God is sovereign over all events, including calamities and discipline in this case. It is true that God does bring discipline upon his people, that ultimately life is in his hands. That is not untrue, right? But Naomi is missing two key points, and, and I found, and I'm sure you found, that when I'm in this place of just blind despair, there's a couple of points I tend to miss too as I charge God. She's unwilling to look at, at her sin in any way. She gives no reasons why God might have been against her. She apparently finds that to be outrageous. She's unwilling to look at her sin and she's unwilling to be surprised by love. Apparently, she assumes well-being is her right. She assumes that being full is her right. She assumed the fullness she had before was normal, and the emptiness could only be explained by an unkind God. Now, that sounds a lot like me when I'm in the middle of difficulty and suffering. There's this blind despair that just takes over. My life is bitter. You want to know about me? Bitter. I've got nothing. And you know why? God. I mean, she doesn't even remember her history very well. If you were so full, why'd you leave? I mean, she rewrites... You know, now it's reversed. I was doing great. And God caused all these things to happen. Well, except that you left the land that he told you to come into. Your sons married Moabite wives. You're living in the land of Chemosh, God of Moab. Uh, Naomi, I mean, I... I I understand the pain of your suffering. Anybody would understand the pain of that. But your suffering is causing you to rewrite your own history, to accuse God, to forget any contribution you've made in walking away from the Lord. And not only that, you seem incapable of being surprised by love. Your daughter-in-law just declared an incredible divine-like declaration of affection towards you and loyalty. Th that seems to have done nothing to bring a pleasantness back into your bitter existence. Isn't that true when we're in this place of just blind despair? We, we, we don't see our, our own sin. We don't see our own places of compromise. We, we can't even see legitimate surprises of God's love. We, we, we turn a blind eye to them because we're so fixated on this idea. God has done me wrong. And I actually enjoy this place of staying in bitterness. It feels right. It feels good. You might be having a little celebration here, but I'm going to put a big nail in that right now. Don't call me pleasant. Call me bitter. Suffering is a test. It's a test. Now, anyone going through suffering, if I was counseling these women that are meeting Naomi, I would not encourage them to rebuke her right then. I would encourage them to listen for a long time about how hard this has been for her. I would encourage her to listen and listen and listen and listen and listen and listen some more and listen about her grief and listen about her sadness and let her rant and rage and rail and listen and listen and listen. But eventually, I would counsel them to say to her, you know what? Next week, when you're talking to Naomi, you might want to just point out that in the midst of all this emptiness, she has an incredible daughter-in-law. Somehow, grief can't become despair. There's a way to grieve with hope, to grieve holding on to gratefulness, 
to grieve holding on to hope. And then there's a way to grieve that shuts your eyes to any belief that God is good, that God is loving, that God is kind. There's two ways to grieve. Naomi seems to be choosing this way. I understand her anguished wail. Why, O oh Lord, would have been totally appropriate. How long, O oh Lord? Why, O oh Lord, have you allowed this to happen? Totally legitimate. But she seems to turn from there to accusation. God is not kind. At the very least, she flirts with that kind of blind refusal to see the goodness of the Lord or her own tendencies towards compromise. She needs to not see fullness as a right. When you read the first chapter of Ruth, I think what you walk away with is this, this strong encouragement. Because you see Naomi, and as you read it, you're, you're sort of drawn away from her, though you can see yourself in her with that kind of pain and suffering. And as you read Ruth, you're kind of drawn towards her, both wanting that kind of love towards you and also hoping you can reflect that towards someone else. But the ultimate exhortation and I think goal of this first chapter is, is something of a, a warning, a, an encouragement, an exhortation. Don't close your eyes to relentless love. Don't close your eyes to relentless love. Isn't that what they were doing in leaving Yahweh's land and going to Moab? Weren't they sort of closing their eyes to God's covenant love and trusting themselves instead? And isn't in Ruth's language, don't we hear the offer, the voice of covenant love present? A voice that we should listen to. She should be seeing God's words flowing out of this Moabite woman and she should be saying, wait, I, I, I'm seeing a love present. It's not coming in the form I would have wanted or expected, but it is coming. But then in the end, Naomi seems to turn away or neglect or forget or turn a blind eye to that offer, and she's determined to stay in her place of despair. And so for us, as we walk away, you can look at here and, and, and see yourself in Naomi's place and say, wait a minute, I am a recipient, if I'm a believer, of this same kind of relentless love of God. I might not see that love in my circumstances. I might not understand why God has allowed certain consequences or certain discipline or certain things present in my life. I may not see any future. I may be like Naomi and say, I'm as good as dead right now. But the push of this passage is to say, don't close your eyes to the relentless love of God. God's relentless love will come after you. It will come finding you. And in Ruth, we have this dual picture of someone who speaks the words of God to us and how God is moving Ruth to act in this way, and also how we can then be an instrument of God's love towards others. That's actually a main reason that I, I wanted, we wanted to read this book is because it, it just shows the intertwining nature of how God's love works. Ultimately, it's the love of God that we receive as empty, needy, broken people, compromised people like Naomi. Having received it, we also have the opportunity to be instruments of that love towards one another, like Ruth. So this book is... is is wonderfully intertwined in that way. At one moment, the person who's the instrument or the spokesman of God's love then becomes the recipient, and then somebody else who's the deliverer of God's love becomes the recipient. And, and this seems to be the, the message of Ruth. Look, look, you're always at the same time a recipient of God's ultimate love and then called to be a, 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 an instrument displaying that love towards one another. And as a church, we're heading into a season where we're going to be talking about community and the building of the church and what it means to be a gospel community and loving one another. Well, any love that we have towards one another is built ultimately on God's love displayed towards us. 
And that love flowing towards us then affects us to such a degree that we display in our limited way his love towards other. And more than display, we actually are the instrument of his love shown to someone else. Incredible, amazing opportunity that Christians have to receive this love of God that he says to us, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Where you go, I will go. Nothing but death, even death itself, will not separate you from me. We receive that, and then we delight to reflect that. I want to hear Ruth for me, and I want to be like Ruth for somebody else. You know, it's amazing when I think about the language that Ruth uses is so much of it is reflective of what Jesus says to us. Don't you hear the language? I mean, the one who comes from his homeland, who leaves his glory aside, who says to his followers, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And even unto death, he will care for and love his people. Don't you hear? The, the reason you hear that language in Christ, it, it's really just the chesed language of God speaking covenant love to his people that is ultimately displayed in the coming of Jesus and the dying of Jesus on the cross. Jesus is the great friend who comes from his homeland, leaves everything behind, and comes and, and says to broken, compromised people, I will never leave you. I will die before I will let you go. I will face death in order to declare my love for you. That's exactly what Jesus does. And so in the kind of love that we see throughout this book, we're going to see it in Ruth, we're going to see it later on in a guy named Boaz, we see this, this generous, sacrificial, self-denying kind of love that finds its ultimate fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ. Yahweh himself comes to every Naomi on the road and says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will die for you. I will ensure that we're where you go, I will go, and I will be with you forever. And says even unto his father, take my life. I give it into your hands as I die to save this Naomi on this road where she's headed. And then for a thousand Naomi's, he turns around and says, now, now you can be like Ruth in your lesser way. And go and show and share this same good news to others. Book of Ruth, it's, it's a, a marvelous true story of God's relentless love. A love we need to receive, a love we want to give. I'm looking forward to seeing the love of God transform our view of him and then transform our desire to display that same type of love towards one another. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful that you are the ultimate picture of steadfast love, loving kindness. We're so grateful that you promise to never leave us or forsake us, that you promise to bind us to yourself, that neither height nor depth nor anything in all creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Lord, we, we hear you echoing behind the voice of Ruth, and we receive that love displayed ultimately in your cross. Lord, we declare right now as a church that ultimately we are not Mara. We are pleasant. Lord, you have done a marvelous thing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. Lord, we rejoice. Let the celebration continue. Yes, indeed. My cup 
overflows. I am indeed the pleasant one. Surely goodness and mercy has followed me all the days of my life. Lord, those that are experiencing suffering, suffering right now, difficulty, pain, Lord, I, I pray you would give them the comfort of your relentless love and that you would enable anyone in that moment, Lord, to have eyes of faith fixed on you in the midst of the mystery. We thank you for that, Lord. I, I pray you would make us a loving church as we read about your love toward us in this book. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you all for being here, for loving God's word, for loving reading and studying it. Um, if you are a guest and you're here with us, um, I, I'd love to meet you. I know Aaron would love to meet you as well. If you have a moment just to make your way up or something, just shake our hand and say hi. We'd love to greet you. Um, see how we can serve you in any way or pray for you any way we can. For the rest of us, have a grace-filled week. We'll see you next Sunday.